Okay, we're recording. I'm with uh, Tony Coe, the Engineering Services Manager, Engineering Services Division, City of Lafayette, and Mover and Shaker in the... Uh, <laughs> we're seeing the, the library progression. Alleged Mover and Shaker. Alleged, uh, true. <laughs> At least I'm here. <laughs> I, get, I only get the real movers and shakers. Um, and I've got his name and address on the business card. And um, I think maybe you've seen these, some of these questions. I have. Okay. Um, and I'm supposed to follow kind of the sequence mm -hmm. and do the, the starred ones. And the only one that wasn't starred <laughs> was the one, what are your favorite childhood books? <laughs> they were comic books, I can tell you that. <laughs> comic books, okay, good, comic books, yeah. <laughs> I believe in reading the comics, <laughs> newspapers, you can tell what's happening in society. So, um, what are your first and best childhood memories of libraries? Could be multiple or one. Well, you know, actually, we didn't have public libraries where I grew up. Where was that? Uh, I was born and raised in Vietnam for 13 years. Oh, you did? Okay. Uh, before I left the country. and moved to a couple other places before I ended up here. Uh, but when I was growing up and going to school, we didn't have public libraries. Um, there is a very small library in the private school that I attended. And uh, it, didn't, it didn't open all the time either. So it was somewhat a very uh, rare privilege to actually get into the library. Sure. Um, like a sacred place. It's a sacred place, exactly. So um, my memories of it was that uh, I would see people checking out, you know, books with color pictures and um, on uh, subjects and stories that uh, I was interested in reading mm -hmm. and kind of you know, being very envy uh, that, you know, they were, able, they were able to get in there and that uh, they were in line before me and they got the book that I wanted. Uh, and uh, being very excited when, you know, when I'm up on the waiting list and being able to uh, get my hands on some of those uh, rare treasures. Yeah. So um, I don't think that I went to a public library until I came to the, the United States. And you know, I I I, I think I was uh, was it much you know high high school age by then. Was it much different your first experience with the public library? Oh yeah, it was much different. Um, first of all, it, it, it's 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 a more um, I guess more commonly available. Uh, you know, it's almost like a viewed as a right here rather than a privilege, right? right. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a f something almost taken for granted, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so um, it doesn't have that air of sacredness that you uh, mentioned earlier right, right. Uh, when, you, when, when I walked in, uh, because, you know, it's, it's not like a, you don't have to take a, you don't, you don't have to go through a lottery to, to, to go to the library, right? It, right. It, there's a whole bunch of people there, books all over the place. Right. Uh, you know, get your hands on whatever you want. Uh, whereas uh, the library that I remember in my childhood was a very small, small room, uh, very private. You know, books were in glass cases. You know, uh, you need to unlock them, uh, check your ID to make sure that you're allowed in there. So it's it's quite a different experience. I th I'm not sure the history, but I think in our country that it was a capitalist who. Uh, Andrew Carnegie, who started the, the movement toward you know, uh, uh, public libraries, it uh, was kind of interesting. Um, so, well, then here we go to the importance of reading. I mean, maybe you didn't have libraries, but was as a kid, was reading important to you? Oh, yeah. Um, you know, I, I don't think that um, reading for academic purposes, I don't think it was, I was doing it for that reason. I think I was reading for entertainment and my own enjoyment, but I read a lot of books. Um, um, obviously, you know, in a different language, uh, oh, yeah, <laughs> a different genre. Yeah. Um, but uh, I remember reading pretty much 
when I'm not in school, I pretty much woke up and read until it was time to eat, and then I go back to reading until it's time to eat again. And uh, I'm probably wearing glasses because I read too, too much. much. <laughs> 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 yeah. Uh, and you know, of course, when I got sick, I was, you know. Not that I enjoy being sick, but it was uh, an excuse that, you know, hey, I, yeah, I can read. <laughs> I can read. <laughs> that was good, though, in, the, in that culture, in that time, because wasn't that a pretty troubled period yeah. of time? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so you could still have access to books? And well, it was mostly, uh, you know, you, 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 you develop a network with people who share your interests, and you basically borrow. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah. so you, we don't have library, so you can't go to the library. You just have... Right. You know, friends, friends and, and, and members of family or, you know, uh, I, I remember whenever I go to a relative's house or a friend's house, I would check out to see what collection they got and, you know, whether it was something that I'm interested in or not. And, right. You have know. you ever been back as, since in the last 20 years? No, no. have not been back. No. have not been back since, uh, I left in 1979. Okay. Yeah. Well, my, my hair cutter is in Lafayette, and she's a Vietnamese. Oh. And uh, it's a Vietnamese shop, pretty much. And um, one Chinese guy, I guess. But anyway, she goes back uh -huh. every year, maybe twice. Oh, uh, it's very much open, more open now. Yeah. Yeah. And the economic uh, openness, I think, is um, it's kind of an it's very, has, has gone quite far since the early days, you know, right immediately after the war. Yeah, that's what she says. It's, yeah. You can get everything things there. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, the, so you grew up in Vietnam, mm -hmm. uh, Saigon or somewhere? Uh, I grew up in uh, another town called Canto. It's about 150 kilometers from Saigon, south of Saigon. It's kind of in the Mekong Delta. Oh. Uh, it's a city, it's a, it's a metropolis, but right. um, by Vietnamese standards, of course, but it's not the capital. Not the capital, right. Right. But, okay. So it was a mixture of kind of rural and a yeah. little, little bit rural? Yeah. Kind of like Stockton or something, or, <laughs> or Sacramento? <laughs> yeah, kind of like Sacramento to San Francisco kind of deal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then the question about awareness of community that you, might have, you must have had a pretty good awareness, I would think. Well, you know, I left when I was 13, so awareness of community would be limited to, you know, that of a, you know, kid. of a kid mm -hmm. who spent most of his time reading. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, I mean, in terms of, you know, civic and social issues, I'm not sure that didn't you, yeah. yeah. Right. You know, other than I knew that a war was going on and to the extent that uh, impending communism, what its impact would be on my family, I mean, I, I was aware of that, right. you know, again, from a child's perspective, but uh, certainly no profound thoughts, right. you know, developed. Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, I think that's where most kids are. I mean, that's the way I was. Um, and, and your education, what did, what did that consist of? Well, uh, I have a degree from Berkeley in engineering. All right, go so, back. So that's the, yeah, exactly. N not very well in the last couple of weeks, but <laughs> it was great before then. There we go, kids got us. Well, we are an academic institution. Uh, exactly. We're not known as a football factory, are we? Uh, but anyway, that's, that's the kind of the extent Okay, your Cal, okay. Yeah. So you came right over. Okay. Um, so, we, but before you went to Cal, did you have uh, high school experience here? Yes, yeah. I went to uh, Galileo High School in San Francisco. Right, yeah, I like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's, I, I, I heard recently that uh, it's become some kind of a science school where, uh, yeah. you know, it's like a, like more of a, yeah, more of an academically focused school. Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, it wasn't that it wasn't the case when I went there. I, I went there from eighty one to eighty five. Mm -hmm. um, so was it a difficult transition? Well, you know, when I first came to the states, I didn't come straight to San Francisco. Um, 
I went to a town in Ohio. Okay. Um, it was kind of a farming village, population 1,000, all white, and oh. corn and wheat fields as far as the eyes can see. Yeah. That was a, that was a transition period sure, for me. Because you were the anomaly in the town. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And so uh, I actually had to learn English from scratch um, when I was there. So I was there, I was in going, I think I did something like six, seven, and eighth grade in a matter of a year and a half or two years or something like that. That compressed. <laughs> well, I had to catch up to my age group. Because okay. um, when I first came, they put me in sixth grade. I mean, I can do certain things in sixth grade, but my reading skill was nowhere near sixth, I mean, I didn't read English, right. so. In com comprehending what the teacher was saying. Students, exactly. Like, what, what is she talking about? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so that's where I kind of did sixth, seventh, eighth grade, and then my family moved to San Francisco. I went to Galileo High School there, and then after high school, you know, I went to Berkeley, and uh, yeah. figured I'd better go get a job. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Well, I mean, engineers, uh, they, they, they have pretty good uh, job prospects, especially with a Berkeley credential. Yeah. Uh, and then in your work uh, post-Berkeley, what, what did that well, happen there? Post-Berkeley, I went into consulting. Actually, while at Berkeley, I worked on an internship for the state um, in, in water resource. So I oh, For the state of California? For the state of California, okay. yeah. Uh, and... Uh, so I did that for about a year and a half, and then when I graduated, there was a consulting job opened up in Oakland for a firm, well, they're still around, DKS Associates. Um, okay. They're still based in Oakland. Now they have offices in Southern California and Oregon. And a civil engineering? Uh, it was a, tr it w well, DKS is really a transportation engineering consultant. Okay. Um, at the time that I graduated, the firm, was trying to establish a bigger presence in civil engineering. Oh, okay. So I kind of came on to uh, participate in that. Right. And then, you know, so I was there for about five years. Then the economy, the economy went bad. Uh, the firm lost a lot of contracts. The clients dried up, and um, they wanted to go back a little bit, or they were leaning back towards more of their core. Sure. of transportation work, you know, coincidentally a, a, a position in Lafayette opened up. Good. So yeah. here I am. <laughs> you, you got it, you had it on your feet, is that what they say? Yeah. And um, so it, did you always have this job in Lafayette? No, I came here, um, actually I after I resigned my position with DKS, I came here as the assistant engineer. At the time, Mark Lander was the city engineer. Okay. Um, and he had, n I don't believe he'd had an assistant uh, until I arrived. So I was probably his first assistant engineer. And then from there on, I've gone through a couple of other positions, three, I believe, um, before I got my current position. And I've been doing this since 97, so. Right. Oh, 97, right. Yeah. So are, are you the chief engineer? I'm the city engineer, yes. Is it? Okay. Yeah. Because the different cities have different titles, and so. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So then you have several people underneath you? I have, I have uh, three other staff engineers working oh. for me. Okay. Uh, and then I also have, uh, you know, a, 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 a transportation planner, a technician, um, and also an, uh, an admin person. Right. Have you ever had a ch chance to meet the people at Fair and Piers? Yeah, I've, I've met a few people at Fair and Piers. Uh, Ellen Poling, for example. She's actually a circulation commissioner for the city. Oh, okay. Uh, so I've talked, I talked to her on and off. Uh, Rob Reese is, a, I believe, a principal over there. Yeah, I, I don't know there. I only knew Jack Piers. Yeah, I think I may have maybe met just Jack met Jack one time. Yeah, um, English guy. Uh, yeah, and not not the not anything related to work either. I believe he lives in Lafayette. Right. Uh, on Silverwood Drive. Yeah. Uh, Isn't it? Well, it's it's off of it's right above the um, the church. The Church. Yeah, I believe it's Silverwood Drive. 
Silverwood. Um, yeah, he came in with a permit for something, and I had a chance to talk to him. So that that was the one occasion that we actually met, yeah. talk, met and talked. Yeah, because I think they had something to do with this, uh, the traffic flow through Lafayette mm -hmm. and uh, the signaling. And right. I was asking about. I says, "Well, we we set it up so that the signals help people." move more expeditiously to get out of the city. We want, we want to make their exit really fast. But they're coming in, we have to kind of calm that down and slow it down. And I said, oh, that's why I'm always late for Well, you know, there's just way too many people are trying to go on Mount Diablo Boulevard and Moraga Road. I think that's the bottom line. I mean, there's only, there's only so much the signals can do. Yeah, we only have one road. It's just yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. I was some other town kind of like this, about the same size, but they had two arteries. Mm -hmm. And what a difference that made. It was just unbelievable. Well, just even having an artery not be the road that goes into your commercial core would make a huge difference. I mean, look at, right. you know, I live in Pleasant Hill. So, you know, in Pleasant Hill, Contra Costa Boulevard is the main artery. Right. But you know the city managed to create off to the side what they call the downtown. Yeah, the new downtown. Right. So you know all the local traffic, people going shopping, restaurant, whatever, don't have to try and squeeze through Contra Costa Boulevard. Right. And uh, sometimes even just that makes a difference. But you know that's not how we are set up. No. Yeah. I don't know what's going to happen in the future. I think that's what you're going to inherit. Yeah. Um, so, as an adult, did you have any community experiences besides work? Um, you know, I leave pretty early and I go home pretty late. So, community experience, you know, at least in the place that I live, is pretty limited. Um, since my daughter's been in school, I've been involved a little bit more with her school-related sure. uh, things. Uh, you know, she plays in a band, so. You know, I'm involved in, uh, you know, whenever she has concerts or right. uh, fundraising, you know, that type of deal. Uh, the inevitable fundraising. Right. Uh, and, you know, this last summer I had a pretty interesting experience in kind of getting to know the education system in California. Uh, of course, you know, all the budget cuts that we've been experiencing, uh, you know, greatly impacts the school. and. Mount Apple School District had to give pink slips to a whole bunch of teachers, and uh, Jordan's music teacher is a very outstanding individual, but he's only been in the district for three years. So he got a pink slip, and there was a prospect of him being shipped out, you know, in favor of someone with more tenure, but, you know, maybe less, Not less skill. outstanding, yeah, yeah. And, and maybe maybe less equipped with dealing with, you know, kids at her level. Um, so, you know, there was a big organized effort to, you know, ask the, this, the, the school board to kind of listen to our concerns and, you know, maybe um, take, a, take a second look at how their policies uh, operate in terms of dismissing teachers based on just seniority versus considering merit and considering qualification. That was an interesting experience. Yeah, it, and it, 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 we, we did not uh, succeed, yeah, uh, did not succeed. Uh, however, uh, it's kind of ironic how this thing turns out. Uh, towards over the summer, as we near the start of the new school year, we were told that you know, uh, financial circumstances maybe were a little bit less dire than they thought, and they were able to withdraw or rescind the pink slip to this particular teacher. But by that time, he had made up his mind that he doesn't want to deal with the California system anymore. He went back to Texas. Oh, oh no. <laughs> so, so the outcome of the, of the whole thing is that, you know, she lost her teacher, but for an entirely different reason. Yeah, right, right. You just couldn't stay around long enough. So yeah. That's a good news. Yeah. So. Uh, what grade is she in? She's in eighth grade. Eighth grade. Oh, okay. Yeah. We just brought our son, our grandson, down from Portland mm -hmm. um, to get tested or trained for taking PSATs. Yeah. Uh huh. And because um, when you get to be a junior in high school, that's still the cutoff. You can't take it after October 
right. your junior year. Right. Uh, the parents didn't quite pick up on that, so we said, well, we'll bring the grandkid down. We'll put him into Ames seminars. Yes. You know about them? I do. Oh, yeah. Well, he's great. And, Good. Uh, yeah, I remember the PSAT. Yeah, we put him through two, two days of getting, him, getting his SATs up, PSAT. Yeah. He's a bright, brilliant guy. Okay. Um, I think you did off yet. It was for the job. Right, and I don't live here, you don't so. Live here. You live in Pleasant Hill. Right. Um, but the, you're still part of the community. I, I am. Yeah, you are. You can't get. You can't escape it. <laughs> and then we go to this big philosophical one. How do you see Lafayette meeting these lofty goals of a place of mutual support and shared values, and acceptance of difference? Well, you know. Um, uh, what I've been impressed with about Lafayette is that the people who live here are probably some of the, mo the smartest, most successful people that you know I've come across. Uh, there's a lot of talent, there's a lot of uh, experience, there's a lot of knowledge yeah, right. in this town. Um, and um, when there's a disagreement, Sometimes the debate can get, you know, kind of heated. Kind of heated, yeah. Uh, because people feel that they have a legitimate point of view based on yeah. the fact that they're all wealthy, highly intellectual, highly educated, right. uh, very used, successful people. Used to getting their way. And used to getting their way. Uh, yeah, that's very true. So, um, but I think. Um, What's good about that also is that in the end, when all the uh, arguments have been made and when all the discussions have been had, you know, I think people can also see that, you know, learn to see the other side's position. Uh, oh, okay. And um, I think in the end, they also can learn that, you know, okay, we've had our say. Uh, this is what the decision makers have decided, or that this is what the majority has decided, or that. These, this is what you know. The people who have the vote decided, and uh, learn to accept that, support that, and move on. And I, I think that's a that's a very healthy thing. Yeah. Um, um, so I think just that process, I think, is is how I think Lafayette comes together. Mm -hmm. um, and you know this library obviously is a very good example of, yeah, of of people coming together who may have different opinions of you know what a library is, whether we need it, and right. what sort of library yeah. we need if we do. And uh, I think in the end, you know, people acknowledge that the decision is made that that we move forward with it, and it's gotten just an unbelievable level of participation from the community. Yeah, uh, not only fundraising, but in terms of people giving their time and in terms of people volunteering for different things like you are now. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so I think it's that kind of coming together of some very highly talented and uh, smart people yeah. who uh, care about the place that they live in. Right. You know, they, they want to have a good outcome. Yeah. That's, I, imagine, I imagine that probably you can feel it in your job compared to some other, yeah. say, Stockton or something. Mm -hmm. so it's, it's Most easy. definitely can feel the passion. Yeah, a little, a little bit more uh, higher higher demanding. Um, OK, so you did probably don't have early memories of Lafayette Library. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> I have been in the I have been in the current Lafayette Library. Right. Uh, the, the the one the one that we're moving out of. I don't I don't know anything about the early Lafayette Library. Right. <laughs> um, but your earliest, your own earliest, out of the ancient library, the, the, the current version. Yeah. Before the new for the the, the the super. Yeah. Version. Yeah. No, but I've been in the current library. I can certainly see why there is such a groundswell for for wanting something different. Yeah, because? <laughs> well, it's awfully small. And, uh, you know, um, and uh, you, you can see that, uh, you know, somebody's trying to have storytelling, you know, in a tiny little corner. And 
other commotional things are going on next to them and um, I heard the you know the library staff their offices you can't you got to walk in sideways you know because there's it's so crowded so small and so cramped so I think um, the need is certainly there I mean that's kind of right and the growth in population yeah. since they built that. I don't, when was that built? I have no idea. Like 67 uh, or 70 right. or something before you even got over here. Yeah, so, you know, my... But it was a small population then. Yeah. yeah. So my memory of it is is more of a validation of, you know, people, what people have already stated is that we need something better. Something better. Yeah. You know. yeah. And not just bigger, bigger of the same. But, um, so do you ever use it personally? Um, on occasions. Uh, I don't use it regularly. Um, I don't read that much anymore. Because <laughs> <laughs> you're too busy. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I've gone in there for a couple travel books from time to time or, um, you know, like if, if, my, uh, if my daughter needs something and we c couldn't pick it up from Pleasant Hill and, you know, I happen to be out in Lafayette you know, she called me up, and I picked something up on my way, right. you know, to lunch or you know, doing lunch or whatever. Uh, but I don't go very often for personal reasons. They have a pretty good good interlibrary loan, yeah. Thing where you can two right. days or whatever they can. right. So if it's on, if it's easier on your track to go there, yeah, yeah. I, I thought that was pretty pretty clever system. And that's pretty old, about forty years ago. Um, how do you feel that a library, this says a library, serves a community? They're not saying this library for this community, but... Well, I think, you know, um, library kind of, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm going to borrow a couple phrases that I've seen around libraries. You know, one is the current campaign. Go ahead. I'll no, that's okay. I'll just let it ring through. Um, but I'll, I won't say anything so that your recording doesn't get messed up. <laughs> so as I said, I was just going to borrow a couple of phrases that I've heard. You know, there's a campaign for the current library that says, Open Door, Open Minds. And I think that's pretty to the point about a library. I think right. it, it basically opens your minds. Um, Right. And, you know, I think in a community like Lafayette, you know, like I said earlier, that the population is already, you know, highly educated and highly intelligent. Uh, so maybe the incremental impact of a library is not as great as, you know, in a different community, maybe one that I grew up in, right. where I think a library really, you know, could have the effect of just raising people's intellectual awareness to a whole different level. Mm -hmm. um, right. And um, so I think in that way, I think they're important. Um, and, uh, you know, I also have heard uh, someone else says, you know, when I was, uh, when I was young, the library um, either rescued me or saved me from, um, you know, getting into trouble. Yeah, right. uh, which I think is also very true. You know, I think for school-age kids. Yeah. Right. Uh, and I think that's how this library will be. I mean, it's right next to Stanley School, next to Lafayette Elementary School. Right. And I think it's going to become a, a a place for not only not only social uh, intellectual development, but also social development for right. school-age kids. I, I, I noticed that at the Rinda Library, you see a lot of kids after school, yeah, either waiting for parents or right, you know. or just wanting to go there because it's a cool place. Uh, hopefully, that's how people will feel about this one. I, I certainly feel like it could, it, it, it will be a cool place to hang out. Yeah, it uh -huh. looks like it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if it doesn't, you're saying miscalculated somewhere. Yeah. Um, now, why don't you tell us a little bit about your involvement? in this new project? Well, you know, um, I didn't get involved in the library until, you know, sort of the, uh, the tail end, of, if you will, of this whole library journey that's been going on for 20, 30 years in Lafayette. Um, 
by the time I got involved, um, you know, the city has already gone through a site selection. We've gone through a design contest with architects. You know, one has already been selected, gone through uh, design development drawings and uh, a whole community outreach process. So I was just basically, you know, uh, by the time it was handed me, I was just tasked with executing it. Yeah. So, uh, uh, you know, my involvement has been, you know, taking the design, development, drawings, and, you know, creating bid documents, uh, bidding it out, uh, you know, and assembling a construction management team, you know, getting the work done, and, uh, you know, basically fulfilling the vision, or at least the infrastructural vision. So the management team you talk about, is that a, a hybrid of your staff and private yes. contractors? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, it's basically uh, one of my staff engineers, uh, my, my, my technician on staff. Uh, I borrowed the admin person from my staff, and I assemble that with um, kind of a, an assistant project manager level person uh, who's a great individual, by the way, Doug Swanson. Uh, I don't know if you've had, if you toured the library and whether you've met no, him or not, no, but um, he has a lot of experience, you know, serving as superintendents of big jobs. I mean, before he came to us, he was, I think he built some huge casino, casino in uh, Las Vegas. Uh, and um, then we have also a person from a construction management firm uh, critical Solutions. Um, we have a person there. Then I also brought in an architect who helps with the daily uh, construction administration work of, you know, answering requests for information or, you know, uh, reviewing submittals, uh, issuing changes, things like that. So I've kind of brought, kind of handpicked professionals from three or four different places and kind of integrated them with some people on my team right. to uh, oversee the whole construction project. But that group is, is our overseers separate from the construction general contractor. That example. group is separate from the contractor. The okay. contra yeah. Right. Okay. yeah. We, have our, we have our own little um, team that basically interacts with the contractor in order to facilitate Mm -hmm. you know, what they need to uh, get the project built. Okay. So. Okay. It's always interesting how, how they organize construction. And yeah. And oversight versus um, the, the guys who are actually doing the work. Right. Um, have you been involved in any other community events or projects, organizations? Um, in Lafayette. Well, no, not necessarily. But no, no, not necessarily Lafayette. Um, well, you know, I'm in charge of all the capital improvements in Lafayette. So all the street, all the street, all street, construction. street construction. You know, before um, we were also doing a lot of the parks projects. You know, again, like next year. Right. Next year we have a trails project in the community park that we're doing. Uh, one of my engineers will be doing uh, oh, uh, out, out, out in the community park by St. Mary's Road, yeah, uh, Burton, Burton, Valley. Burton Valley. Um, and the community center, you know, the Manzanita room is going to get renovated. Uh, the book room there, okay. after the Friends of Library move into their new and beautiful home, they're going to move out of the community center book room. We're going to renovate that for other Use. use. Yeah, so we'll be involved in that, uh, or one of my staff engineers will be involved in that. Um, so, any kind of, you know, and you know, previously we built the South End ball fields, the sports fields right. on St. Mary's, the Buckeye fields, you know, we, yeah. engineering department built that. Um, we redid the downtown plaza here across from Safeway, you yeah. know. Uh, on, That's nice. So, uh, basically, any kind of public works infrastructure type building, um, you know, I've been fortunate to participate in mm -hmm. in Lafayette. 
So so. They, if they do like sewers, a redo of sewers like they've done in Orinda, mm -hmm. um, where they, they do that un excavation underground with the right, tunneling, mm -hmm. boring machine. Yeah. Um, do you have involvement with that? Uh, no. Uh, sewers here are owned by this uh, contra, contra, centra, yeah, Central Contra Costa Sanitation District. So they would be uh, responsible for any kind of renewal or repair of their facilities. We issue them a permit just so that, you know, they, uh, we can be sure that they exercise the correct uh, traffic control and co safety precaution measures. Right when they're working in the road. And when they're done, that you know, they restore the road back to what it was before. But in terms of the actual installation of the sewer or having anything to do with the sewer facilities themselves, we are kind of hands off on that. Same thing with water. Yeah, you know, okay. East Bay Mud owns water. And you know, same thing with you know, gas and electrical like facilities. Uh, we have oversight in terms of how they operate and how they impact the street and the surrounding area, but we don't really get into their business. No, right. I was just thinking when you said that about the gas, I was thinking about that gas line in Walnut Creek. There. Oh yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, we were, my wife and I were on the bike trail when it went off. So wow, that must have been an experience. We were only about, uh, oh, a couple of hundred yards from us. Wow, so did you probably... Well, we saw the smoke, we didn't hear the see flames or anything, but there's smoke that came out. We said, what is going on? You probably felt like a bomb went off. We, we just kept on going. <laughs> we came back, and there's still this huge cloud, and it was all, everything was cordoned off, emergency vehicle. Yeah. Okay. Um, there is a question I had in here that popped out. It, it was about, because with your um, engineering background, it has to do kind of with the internet. Uh -huh. um, what do you think that would be the impact on libraries as, or this current library, how the internet is going to impact it? Do, I mean, in, enhance it or degrade it? Right. I think, I think that uh, I read something in here about the internet being the death of libraries or something like that. Is, is that the question well, you're referring yeah, to? Yeah. It, it, I don't know if it's in here. Yeah, yeah it's under library it's future. Word and libraries would become obsolete. Yeah. How will our new library avoid such a thing? Yeah. You know, I think that um, there will be people who would come to the Lafayette Library for reasons that have nothing to do with the library. I think we've created a project that is just orders of magnitude more than about the library. I think the library is just, physically, the library is just one floor in this project that we've built, but also figuratively, uh, this learning center that we've created, I think it's gonna be more, more than just the li about libraries and books and libraries. I mean, I think, you know, uh, the whole learning consortium that I'm sure you're aware of. I mean, there's going to be a lot of other intellectually stimulating uh, programs um, that will draw people to participate, to come to the library and, and not even go into the library space. Right. Uh, but, you know, even at a very, at, at the simplest level, I think there will be people who would go to the library just as a destination just to see the building. Right. Oh, okay. I think that um, the architecture is very interesting. I sure. think that there are components in the library that are just uh, kind of attractions by themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we have two art installations that are going in. There's one on the children's activity deck where I think moms and dads would just bring their kids to go to the children's activity deck just to be there to, to experience it. Right. And not necessarily to go and borrow a book. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, we have a, a, a sculptor uh, installation that's in the plaza area. I mean, the, this artist did something very similar in North Beach in San Francisco. And again, I think it's a piece where I think people would just come to see what it's about. I mean, they, they would go to the library just to see it. And we have other things like a solar art installation in the library, on the library floor, that I think 
I'm sorry, what's it called? It's a solar art. Solar, oh yeah, solar, uh, yeah, right. Uh, it's a solar art installation. I, I saw the model of it. I saw similar work by this artist in other areas of the world. And I think, again, it's the kind of thing where you go to see it like you would in a museum, you, like you would go to a museum. Right. Uh, so I think in that way. It has a bit of an art, in that case, it has an artistic attraction. Yes, yeah. I think in that way, this, uh, you know, I think. And, and you know, even with books, I mean, you can, yeah, you can say that you can read books on the internet and you can, you know, there's electronic books mm -hmm. uh, these cool. days. Yeah, exactly. Um, but you will never be able to read a book in the same ambience, in the same atmosphere mm -hmm. that you will in this library when you are at home. Yeah, right. right. So and I think that when one, once it opens up and people have a chance to experience it, I think many people will agree with me that you, you can read a book at home, but you, I don't think you quite get the same experience right. as uh, going through the library. Right. So I think, in that, I think that's something that the internet will never be able to replicate, and I think in that sense, I think we're safe from the internet. <laughs> In this case. In this case. <laughs> this particular case. Not only the unique case. But, you know, you mentioned solar. I was driving behind it the other day, and I happened to see all the solar panels on the back side. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, which I, I gather that's to help cut the electric bill and, and, and be lead. Yeah. But it seemed to me like they. The um, what do you call it? The orientation and the, the height was too. I mean, it was suppressed. It's not going to get as much sunlight as it, if it was up higher somewhere. Well, you know, I think we were trying to. Yeah, we were trying to balance a lot of things with that installation. I think we were trying to do what is more environmentally responsible. Uh, by generating some of the electricity ourselves. Right. Uh, at the same time, you know, the, the, that is a outdoor parking area. So by installing the solar panels in a kind of a carport configuration, you know, we can have the sun generate electricity instead of baking the cars. Baking the cars. Oh, that's a great idea, yeah. Yeah, and, and, you know, we didn't come up with it. I mean, a lot of school, um, you know, colleges and uh, other big commercial building complexes have already done this. So it's just an idea that we're copying and saying it's a good idea, we're just copying it from other right. people. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, we have to be sensitive to the fact that this is Lafayette and we just don't want to put up a whole bunch of solar panel right. in a very industrial looking it's, way. It's not an industrial center, yeah. Exactly. So we were, try we were trying to balance all of that and the, the end result is what you see. Uh, some, some of it on the upper tier is a little bit higher up, uh, and the ones that are in the carport, part of it, yeah. yeah, the ones over the parking area are more like in a carport configuration that, you know, is, is more subtle, if you will, visually. Yes, right. Um, but I think uh, would still be very efficient um, and it's not a huge system that we design anyway. It's a 40 kilowatt system. Um, I think, you know, under very peak condition, it may generate something in the order of 10% of the electrical load okay. in, this, in the, in, in the building. Yeah. Right. Uh, but obviously, you know, on a Sunday when nothing's going on, it's, you know, feeding back into the system. Right. Uh, or in the winter time when you're not using a lot of electricity. Uh, yeah for cooling. Uh, yeah, so you're, you're switching to natural gas for heating. Yeah, yeah. Good. Well, right. you helped me get me some good, good in. Let's see, is there any other question that would be, or anything that we should touch on that you think that... Um, oh, I think I said a whole bunch, and you, uh, I, I'm sure you're going to edit this, right? <laughs> uh, um, you're going to just take every little... Uh, <laughs> Miss you, you said. <laughs> um, I 
haven't even looked at what, what you all signed here, but if you'd like to look at it after, I think it's going to be my wife, actually, who's going to do the transcription. Uh-huh. And, um, I read it uh, pretty quickly when I first saw it, when you first sent it through. You will be sensitive. Yeah. Uh, no, but I was just going to say, you know, I, I think that I don't know how big your, uh, your project is in terms of, you know, I mean, is this something that you're trying to come up with like a two-hour program or a fixed time program of snippets of thoughts from different people. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Uh, the lady who heads it up is named Brenda Hepler. Uh -huh. Have you ever met her? No, I have not met. Um, her background is um, well, a couple of things. Well, she's a storyteller. That's how she likes to ah, describe herself. I see. And uh, so she's been, she has that interest in the library that we have. Right. We have a good program that relates to storytelling. Right. So forth. Right. So, but uh, in her other part of her life, she's she's involved in this new thing for um, sex slaves and human trafficking. Oh. So she has a it's a nonprofit organization, and mm -hmm. all of the proceeds go in. I mean, go into uh, helping to reduce this. And uh, it's essentially just selling um, these little tags that go on your luggage. Mm. You know, the type that don't get easily torn off. And right. So it's it's kind of a partly woven. I think it's, it's made in some Afghanistan or someplace, some third world or some third world country. Mm. So that's her other part of her life. But she's a Lafayette resident and I think there's going to be a portion in the library so that people who do a little research in it will want to hear about the thinking. I see. Of the people who were involved mm -hmm. in bringing this whole thing to fruition because it's had a, like,